All right, so I'm going to cover the verses where it proves that hellfire is truly eternal. So that is a basic doctrine in evangelical Christianity. That is a basic fundamental doctrine. Okay, Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, please. Verse 10. The Word of God reads right here concerning about people that they are eternally tormented. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So notice right here that uh, these group of people, they are tormented with fire and brimstone, but how long? Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night. So notice right here that concerning the eternal torments of hell, that this is truly eternal, we got to understand. It is truly eternal. It is not something that is temporary. Now, there's a doctrine called annihilation. So they believe that once you're cast into this lake of fire, they believe that you will be annihilated. So it's like as if you go in there and then poof, you're gone. But obviously, we deny this. Amen. We don't believe that's true. Annihilation? No, it's eternal torment. Notice the verses right here, smoke of their torment, right? It says torment, ascendeth up forever and ever. No, it's forever. It's not an annihilation. That's totally wrong. It's actually forever. Based off of Revelation chapter 14, verse 10 through 11. Now, Jehovah Witnesses are one of the top three groups that you will find the most difficult to talk to concerning Bible. Uh, one of the three groups you will find the most annoying. So it's Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, and then Calvinist. So then these three groups you will find much difficult time with. So Jehovah Witness, they will always bring up a counter-argument, even if you show them a verse, or they'll insert their interpretation. What they're going to say is that, well, what it means is that a person is annihilated forever. So even though it says forever, they're annihilated forever. So it makes sense. It's forever, but they're annihilated. So that's their argument. But it does not make sense. Why would you have to put forever after annihilated then? That does not make sense. Annihilated means you're gone. You don't have to put forever after that unless there's some meaning behind it where a person is perpetually still there, not non-existent. So then how are we going to argue this? You'll notice that at verse 11, the middle of verse 11, they have what? No rest day nor night. So notice right here, they're still alive. So based off of Revelation chapter 14, and then verses 10 through 12, you'll notice right here that these people are still alive. They're alive. Why? Because it says forever. Because they said rest. By the way, if they're annihilated, doesn't that mean that they're fi they finally rested then? Finally they're gone? From, they're free from the torment? No. So it says right here, no rest, right? Because it says no rest, it shows right here they still got to be alive in there. They still got to be tormented. If it said rest, then what would happen is that that means that they've been annihilated. So thus, this verse definitely disproves annihilation. There's no way that annihilation will work in this case right here. It also say, says day nor night, as if it's a daily thing. They have no rest day nor night. Okay, let's also look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. So the first case is Revelation 14, 10 through 11. The second one that you want to resort to is Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> We're going to look at verse 10, and then I want your second hand, your second hand to also go to chapter 21, verse 8. Chapter 21, verse 8. Let's assume this is a place of annihilation. Then it does not make sense when you read these following verses. Uh, I don't know if I'm blocking, so just let me know. Revelation chapter 20, and then we'll read verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So notice Satan was cast into what? 
the lake of fire and brimstone, right? Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented, what? Day and night forever and ever. So notice right here that this is perpetual. This is continual. The lake of fire is not a place of annihilation. It's a place where you burn forever. Now they might argue, well, that's only for Satan. That's not true. Look at Revelation 21 verse 8. Who else is joining them in the lake of fire, which is tormented forever and ever? But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So notice right here, based off of Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, that sinners go to the lake of fire, which is eternal. Sinners burn in the lake of fire, which is eternal. So the lake of fire is not a place of annihilation. It is a place of eternal torment. Now there's a weird doctrine from Seventh-day Adventists. They also don't believe in eternal torment, actually. So Seventh-day Adventists, they would argue that uh, all the people's sins, when they go up before God at the throne, in, this includes the unbeliever's sin. All of them will be cast upon Satan. So Satan will be the one who will be considered the scapegoat. It's called the scapegoat doctrine. Who will take all your sins upon himself, and he's the one who burns in hell for you for all eternity, not you. Now that's not a popular teaching, but that's what Seventh-day Adventists teach. If they're really a genuine Seventh-day Adventist, they will teach that. But I bet you a lot of them don't publicly talk about it now because it is controversial. Because it is heretical. It sounds heretical. That's heresy. Because who is the scapegoat who took all our sins upon himself? It's Jesus Christ. It's not the devil. Now, attributing, uh, attributing Jesus' place with Satan, that's, that's pretty much borderline blasphemy right there. Seventh-day Adventism is a religion of heresy. It is a cult. Let's also turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And then we'll read verse 41. Matthew chapter 25, and then we'll read verse 41. <clears throat> Let's look at a third case right here. In Matthew chapter 25, and verse 31, the Word of God shows that the place of hell is eternal punishment. It is eternal punishment. Now think about it. If you're punished for eternity, that shows that it's not a temporary place. It's an eternal place. Now this is going to be a powerful argument against Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. So you want to pay attention to this first right here. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, excuse me. Thank you. 25, verse 41. Thank you. That shows that y'all looking at your Bible. <laughs> y'all don't want to believe this preacher. You got to look at the Bible, right? I've been saying that quite a few times to everybody. I've been saying that to the members and newcomers. You got to check that book. You can't just uh, hear what I'm saying. You got to look at the book. You got to look at the book. That way you can believe it more. You can only believe when you see for yourself the Word of God. Not when pastor or someone's just trying to tell you. It doesn't become believable to the person just hearing it from your mouth. It becomes believable when you look at the verse and you read it and you see it for yourself. That's why I keep stressing so much that you got to be independent. You got to look at the verse. You got to study the verse for yourself. All right, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart, uh, right here, depart from me. He cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So notice right here, it says into what kind of fire? Everlasting, right? Now look at verse 46, verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So notice right here that the punishment is everlasting. It's not temporary. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses, they're going to argue, and probably some Seventh-day Adventists as well, it just really means the punishment of fire will be everlasting, but not the person burning in it, because the person will be annihilated in the fire. 
So that's what Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists believe in. So they believe and they teach that once you're cast into hell, once you're cast into the lake of fire, that it says everlasting fire, right? doesn't mean the person is everlasting in it. <laughs> that's their way to argue against it. Now, I feel like it's pointless then, okay? Let's use some common sense. Then why would the fire continue if there's no one in there? Exactly. Yeah, that does not make sense. So that's just common sense. But let's use this argument here. What we can use in the argument right here is that you'll notice it said at verse 41, prepared for who? The devil, the devil and his angels. Now, remember Revelation 20, verse 10? What did it say at Revelation 20, verse 10? The lake of fire where Satan is, where he is tormented forever and ever. See, so it's not just some fire that's forever. It's the torment, the person in it that's burning forever as well. So that's pretty obvious. But another thing to argue right here is this, is that how can you honestly call it everlasting, what, punishment? If you're going to be punished for eternity, it doesn't make sense when you go poof like that then you're not punished for eternity. <laughs> punished for eternity means the punishment is still going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it means. But here's another thing. This one is going to be fun. You can use this line on a Jehovah Witness and Seventh-day Adventist. Then I guess at verse 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. So the fire is only eternal, not the person in it, but the righteous into life eternal. So I guess heaven is permanent, but not the person in it. See that? They're not going to fall for that. So the thing is this. They would sooner believe that you would live in eternity in heaven, but they wouldn't do that for hell. Why is that? See, that's picking and choosing. That's biased interpretation then. If you read verse 46, if you're going to make the people living in heaven eternal, you got to do the same thing with the people who are burning in hell in that same verse. See, they're picking and choosing. And that's where you can catch them. That's where you can catch them. Yeah. Let them interpret. You don't have to be scared when they give their argument on how they interpret the verse. Let them th shoot off their mouth okay. and act intelligent. And then after that, then you sh prove to them, you know, I think that's your biased interpretation. No, I was just reading right here. That's what they're going to argue. No, just look at the scripture, context or whatever. And then you say, okay, then verse 46, why did you biasly pick that this one is eternal in heaven or the kingdom on earth, wherever they want to call it. But then, hell, you make that temporary. You caught them. And then you prove that they were biased in their interpretation. And they realize that they shot off their mouth like a fool for 10 minutes, trying to interpret the verse, claiming they were not biased, and you caught them lying when you go to verse 46. That's what you're going to find out with Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists. What you need to do is... Don't be scared when they interpret the verse. The best thing to do is let them shoot off their mouth and then you trap them where you catch them and prove their bias. That's the best thing to do. That's the best thing to do. That's how you can argue more successfully with Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses. Let's also look at Mark chapter 9, please. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. By the way, these verses are all found in the Jehovah Witness Bible too what you found so far. You can use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove that hellfire is eternal with all those verses. Yeah, so all these verses prove that hellfire is eternal. Now, that's only from 1, 2, and 3. Starting at number 4, the Jehovah Witness Bible is going to word it differently now, okay? So starting from number 4 and onwards. So let's start off with Mark chapter 9, and then we'll read verses 43 through 45. Why is hellfire eternal? Because the Bible says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be what? Quenched. See, this is eternal. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So notice right here that hellfire is eternal, that it cannot, uh, it cannot go away. It's not annihilation. Now, there are several <laughs> arguments against this. 
several arguments. So one of the arguments against this is that your King James Bible says hell, but the Jehovah Witness Bible will call it Gehenna, okay? Gehenna. So what is Gehenna? If you look up Gehenna, it's some kind of trash heap on the outskirts of Israel. So then they're going to claim that what this fire is, is that where you throw the trash, the garbage outside on the outskirts of Israel, and then it's burning up. So then that's what they will argue. It's not talking about hell, it's Gehenna. Now, the thing is this, is that uh, how you can easily debunk them is this. This argument is debunked when you actually look at the verse 43. Isn't this silly? Doesn't it sound silly that Jesus says, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into eternal life with, uh, without two hands than having two hands to go into the trash heap on the outskirts of Israel where the trash is burning. Doesn't that sound silly? Yeah, so Jesus is saying, before you go outside in the trash heap on the outskirts of Israel, you better cut off both of your hands. That's, that's preferable. That doesn't make sense. Unless this is talking about hell, a truly eternal place of torment. And it's better that you cut off your hands and have your whole body being cast into hell fire. See, that would make more sense. But not only that, let's look at Matthew 23. So what you're going to catch from them is that they don't like the word hell. Jehovah Witnesses hate the word hell, so they would translate it to Gehenna. But this becomes a double-edged sword to them. Gehenna is a Greek word. Or from Hebrew to Greek, whatever. But the point is, is that it was originally written in Greek. And then in Greek, the KJV translated, uh, the KJV translators translated that into English, which is what? Hell. That's very simple. So, in other words, it's not an inaccurate translation. Jehovah Witnesses will argue, oh, it was inaccurately translated because it should be Gehenna. No, Gehenna is a Greek word. When you translate that into English, it's hell. It's hell, you got to understand. Now, the thing is this, is that how we know it's hell, if they want to insist on Gehenna, some trash heap on the outskirts of Israel, look how this interpretation works. So, in the Jehovah Witness Bible, they replaced hell with Gehenna here. Let's look at Matthew chapter 23, and look at verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of the trash heap on the outskirts of Israel? Does that work? No. That does not work. Yeah. They translated that word to Gehenna. So that doesn't make sense, does it? This Gehenna must be hellfire then. It's not referring to some trash heap on the outskirts of Israel. What in the world? That just sounds ridiculous. So make them look silly by mentioning that to them. Okay, let's also look at another passage here. We're going to look another counter argument that they will do is they will say that it's figurative. Well, isn't that convenient? So what they would like to do is that they would like to argue that it's figurative. It's not literal where you burn in hell forever. It's figurative. Figurative for what? Basically, that sin is like an unquenchable fire that will burn much guilt into the conscience. That's their interpretation for that. And that sounds really nice. Now, the problem with that is that one, one, they don't have a single verse to prove that interpretation. You can interpret anything out of that. You can say sin is like an unquenchable fire that burned much guilt into the conscience, or you can say that it's some burning bosom that the Mormons talk about that we feel in the sensation of our body, and it is unquenchable. See, you can argue anything for a figurative interpretation over there. But how do you know which interpretation is right? You have to have scripture clearly showing that interpretation. That's how you uh, prove the interpretation, scripture with scripture. But here's another thing. What about the context of verse 47? If we're going to argue 43 is figurative, are we going to make four, uh, verse 47 figurative? And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. Oh, it's got to be figurative. It is better for thee to enter into the what? Kingdom of God with one eye. You're going to make heaven figurative? Then having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Oh, but that's figurative. So look at right here. In the middle of verse 47, Jehovah Witnesses, they do believe in a literal 
physical kingdom of God. But then they're going to switch it to uh, figurative when it comes to hellfire in the same verse, verse 47. Then you know what you prove to them again? You're biased in your interpretation. You caught them again. Jehovah Witnesses, they all talk about the kingdom of God. We're all going to live in the kingdom of God on earth, you know, the paradise on earth. And then you catch them right there. Okay, you believe this is literal and physical? Yes. Okay, then why do you switch it? Why did you switch it from figurative to literal physical and then you switch it back to figurative again? In the same verse, verse 47, <laughs> the same verse. So figurative is definitely out of the picture. Why? Because based off of verse 47, you caught them. You proved them. Verse 47. All right, here's a third argument. The third argument for this is that it says the worm in verse 44, where their worm will not die. It's not humans, it's worm. So thus it proves this must be some garbage disposal on the outskirts of Israel, where the worms are all crawling. It's not people burning, it's worms. But you got to understand this. The verse 44, it says where their worm what? Dieth not. That is some worm, man. You really think that's a worm? Well, that's got to be some worm right there. That doesn't make sense. So you got to understand here, worms live forever. And obviously, that's not true, that worms, these bugs, live forever. You know what's referring to? Scripture with Scripture, Job chapter 25, verse 6. Job chapter 25, verse 6. You look at Scripture with Scripture. You know worms are referring to? Humans in depravity. Humans in depraved conditions. That's what worm is referring to. You might say, oh, you just made that up. No, scripture with scripture again. Now, look, I would have made that up if I didn't show you a verse on that. Mm -hmm. I hope you are observant about that. So how do we know whose interpretation is right? You got to let the scriptures reveal to you. All right, let's look at the book of Job, chapter 25. We will read verse 6. The Bible says, How much less man that is a what? Worm. And the son of man which is a what? All right, look at Psalms 22, verse 6. Psalms chapter 22, verse 6. The scriptures are going to reveal it to you. It shows the answer every single time. Look at Psalms chapter 22. We will read verse 6. <clears throat> Notice that the word of God again reveals that man is a worm. But I am a what? Worm. worm. And no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. See, humans in depraved condition. We see that every single time. Isaiah 41. Isaiah chapter 41. The evidence keeps building up. The evidence keeps building up. Isaiah chapter 41. We'll read verse 14. Isaiah 41. We'll read verse 14. Uh, let me know if both cameras, if I'm out of bound on both cameras. Isaiah chapter 41. We will read verse 14. Fear not thou what? Worm Jacob. So notice right here that Isaiah 41 verse 14, that it's referring to a group of people as well, that is called a worm. So notice that scripture, scripture proves everything. Now look at Revelation chapter 20 verse 14. Here's a final verse that we can use against Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses. Look at Revelation chapter 20, and we will read verse 14. Number five. This verse proves that... This verse proves that hell is the lake of fire. Now, Jehovah Witnesses, what they argue is this. What they argue is that hell is a grave. Hell has no fire whatsoever. Jehovah Witnesses believe in a lake of fire, but they believe the lake of fire is a separate place from hell. So the lake of fire is the only place that has fire. And if a soul goes in there, they're annihilated. But hell, it has no fire whatsoever. It's simply the grave. So whenever the Bible talks about hell, it's the grave. It's not talking about a place that has fire. Uh, that's not true. Revelation 20, verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the what? Lake of fire. This is the second death. See, whether you like it or not, you can say, okay, you want to call it Hades? You want to call it the grave? It's going to have fire either way. 
So agree with them. So Jehovah Witnesses, they're always going to say this. They always go for Greek words because they don't like this English word because they know what this English word means. So the Greek word at Revelation 20, verse 14, is Hades. Now, again, the KJV translators, they know this is a Greek word, so they translated this into what? Hell. Jehovah Witnesses don't like the English word because they know what the English means. But because Jehovah Witnesses really don't know Greek, even though they pretend to know Greek, because they don't know Greek, they like this Greek word because they don't know what that means. So Hades, it doesn't mean a place of fire. Now, the, you can say this, okay, I will call it Hades. And, and then the Jehovah Witness will say, thank you, I convinced you it's Hades. And then you say, it says right here, and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Hades has fire either way. <laughs> when you do that, see them foam at the mouth after that. I mean, they don't like that. They don't like that. Because uh, you just debunked them in their, you played in their playground and you debunked them. I've done that before. Jehovah Witness did not like that answer. So then what they would like to argue is this, is that, well, you can't say that it's literal. You can't say that it's literal right here because it says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. It doesn't make sense that death is literally cast into the lake of fire. So that doesn't mean hell is literally cast into the lake of fire. So that's what they're going to argue. No, we argue it's literal because keep reading. Verse 14, this is the what? Second death. It becomes a second death. So death is literally cast into there. Hell is literally cast into there. And through that transformation, it becomes the second death. How about that? So that's where you debunk them right there. So you got them. But not only that, the point is this. The point, it, it says lake of fire, right? Remember, the lake of fire, is it temporary or eternal? Eternal, based off of what? Based on the previous verses. So you got them. So hell is eternal fire. You thus got proof. Or Hades, to please our Jehovah Witness friends out there, Hades has eternal torment, eternal fire. No way around it.